So now we know all the changes in the new Arcs of Omen season, which armies in Warhammer 40k are looking to be the most improved and which ones are losing out the most. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where over the last couple of days we've been talking quite a bit about this new Arcs of Omen update that Games Workshop have come out with. We've talked through several of the armies and their updates and how people might be changing their lists going forward, but today I thought we'd do a bit more of a general overview, talking about each and every army in Warhammer 40k and whether or not these updates have been an overall win or loss for them. As I'm sure most of you will be well aware by now, Arcs of Omen brings a pretty massive reboot to Warhammer 40k. Overall, I'd say it's basically five different changes layered on top of each other. The balanced data slate changing a bunch of rules for different factions. It also removed Armour of Contempt, making AP-1 weapons in particular a bit better against the field. The Munitor and Field Manual with a bunch of points changes, some nerfs and buffs. A bunch of changes to the core game rules between the different updates. That new Arcs of Omen detachment from the new competitive season. The flyer nerfs from the data sheet, and strategic reserves and the new ally system from the Arcs of Omen rules, all of which might help or hinder certain armies. Then we've got new and rebalanced secondary objectives for each faction, both the generic ones and the ones for each army, and perhaps just a little bit more subtly the removal of a bunch of supplemental content for many armies, a few things like the Death Guard Terminus Est Strike Force, the Witch Cult of Strife, or the Abmex Guitari Veteran Cohort are technically no longer game legal, and Games Workshop did confirm that in their stream. It's a really big mishmash of changes, and many armies are going to be getting better or worse on a whole load of fronts, so I thought we'd go through each army one by one, talking about the major changes for all of these when you add them all up, and whether or not I think that they're stronger or weaker overall. We'll start with the armies that I think have overall lost out the most, and move forward to the ones that I think have gained the most from this update. I would bear in mind though that this isn't really a tier list or anything, this is more the armies that I think are going to be changing the most, though a fair few of the ones that got hit the worst with nerfs were already very strong, and some of the ones that were buffed the most were also armies that started out pretty weak. So let's get into it then, and first up we'll start with the armies that I think have overall got worse the most, and the armies that are considered there will be the Chaos Space Marines, Harlequins and Tyranids. All of these I think were doing kind of well before, particularly Harlequins and Tyranids, and I guess it's perhaps not too unexpected that Games Workshop have hit them with some fairly hefty nerfs. First up we've got Chaos Space Marines, which are perhaps an army that I thought got hit a bit harder than I was expecting. As an army they were doing kind of fine in Nephilim, an overall win rate around about 52%, Plenty of decent tournament wins, though quite a lot of variation between legions, things like Emperor's Children and Creations of Bile doing far better than many of the others. They did get a few advantages from Arcs of Omen, their secondaries generally got a little bit better, though not loads. I'd say perhaps the biggest winners on that game were the Long War one and the Emperor's Children Paint the Canvas one. Both of those could easily get you a few more points than before. I guess they'll quite like the HQs and the Arcs of Omen detachment, that allows you four HQs now, and in general for Chaos Space Marines they're quite good. And you'll be a bit more tempted to take allies with them now. War Dogs in particular seem like quite a nice choice, getting you some fast moving fire support, and now they won't eat into the CP that you need to spend on Warlord traits and relics. Otherwise, they did get a fair few war gear boosts within the Codex, some of their fairly neglected vehicle motor pool. That got a little bit stronger, as did Chaos Legionaries with some pre last cannons and things. Finally, it's fairly good news for Golax, that relic demon weapon. That was already a staple in armies. Having that ignore minus one damage mechanics makes it even stronger, and perhaps even more auto include. For all the good stuff though, they did receive three rather big nerfs. First up, Creations of Bile basically had its Legion trait pretty well toned down. Previously you'd just fight in death if you were slain in melee, now it only happens on a 4+, plus, far less reliable and just overall less powerful. I feel like this is probably going to get played a lot less than say Black Legion, World Bearers or Emperor's Children now, and having the faction that's won the most tournaments be far less of a thing I think is going to make an impact on their strength. I'd say perhaps the biggest change though might be losing Armour of Contempt. It's a very good army-wide durability increase and just not to have it anymore really is going to hit them hard. Unlike standard Codex Space Marines or Death Guard or Grey Knights, they didn't really get any wide sweeping points cuts to account for it. So I think it is just going to be a faction power cut overall. It'll probably make things like Demon Units a lot more relevant, things with 5 plus invul saves like Possessed. Finally, there were a few points nerfs to the faction, fairly focused on some of the very best stuff. Abaddon goes up to 350, Chaos Terminator to 36, and the Mark of Slanesh to 20 points. All of those were staples in the vast majority of competitive lists, and again it is going to be a small nerf overall. Not insurmountable, but if you want to bring those toys to the table, it's going to get you less stuff now. Overall, I feel like this totals up to Chaos Space Marines just not being anywhere near as strong as they were. 
is not all bad news, but in general I think they've faced some of the very biggest nerfs, and unlike Tyranids and Harlequins, which are also here, they weren't starting out from the very top of 40k, I'd say they were good, but many of their legions weren't outstanding, and a lot of the data sheets in the codex aren't even that great. I feel like perhaps Games Workshop might have been just a little bit overzealous with these guys, maybe a few more points cuts would have been nice if they're just going to flat out remove Armour of Contempt like that. Moving on, we've got the Harlequins. Prior to the changes, I believe that these guys were typically sitting on about the best win rate in Warhammer 40k, around about 57-58%ish, and despite not it being all that played, they had a ridiculous amount of tournament wins and were very popular as a faction. The Harlequins have had a whole ton of nerfs from previous data slates, and this one certainly didn't let up all that much. The big change for Harlequins was having their invul saves toned down from a 4 plus to a 5 plus faction wide, and even their 3 plus ones go down to a 4. Almost everything in 40k is just going to kill them a fair bit more efficiently, anything bar mortal wounds I guess, and it also kind of has a knock-on effect for luck dice as well, where they were really quite good to invest in re-rolling those decent saves. Now it's going to be a bit more questionable if you're fishing for 5 pluses. That's on top of their multiple other nerfs, things like points increases and turning down both light and dark, and to add insult to injury their secondaries are slightly toned down as well, we veil deadly performance and psychic interrogation are all a bit worse, all of which will probably hurt them on the points. There are perhaps a few things that have gone the Harlequin's way. A few of the combos that they've basically broken with rules changes are now allowed again, but they just cost a lot of points. The Shadow Seer's one for counting enemy guns as further away is now back in action. Previously it was just affecting one unit, but now it costs a massive 60 points, so it's still probably not worth it, I would guess. The Death Jester also has that slightly high investment combo with the Warball trait and the Exploding Sixes. Favour of Segarak can now be comboed with that Pivotal Roll once more for some very big sniper damage. The Pivotal Roll now costs you 40 points. I'd say that probably brings it back into the territory of it being kind of usable, but high investment. Similar to the Craft Worlds as well, they also got the restriction on Fire and Fade lifted. You can now use it multiple times per game, and it is actually quite an important one for Harlequins. A very nasty movement trick to have on your troops and Skyweavers and things darting forward, and perhaps it's particularly nice for Void Weavers, who could have a big unit jump out, smash something, and then hide behind terrain again, save from reprisals. I guess you could also spam a few more troops as well. If you want to have a list that's almost nothing but troops in Star Weavers, that's more doable. That is one of their stronger builds, and you wouldn't have to pay more CP for it now. Overall though, I feel like those invul saves getting nerfed is generally going to mean that the faction's far toned down. They're going to die a lot easier whenever they're exposed now, and I feel like this is going to quite firmly kick them back into the mid-tier, as opposed to being one of the strongest factions in the game. I feel like Harlequins aren't going to be outright weak though. They've still got crazy movement and can swarm and hit quite hard when they need to. I feel like maybe they're going to be a bit more in the place of Gene Stealer Cult at the moment. Perhaps an army that's fairly fragile and now a bit harder to play with, but if someone makes maximal use of all their gamey tricks, then they can still do well. Lastly, I think taking the crown for the single most brutal set of nerfs in this entire update are the Tyranids. The swarms from Beyond the Galaxy have seen a whole ton of changes since their codex dropped. It's kind of surprising they've had two massive waves of nerfs, and despite that, they were still one of the top factions in the game, hoovering enemies off the board with their psychic and good shooting. In Nephilim, they were winning around about 57% of their tournament games, one of the game's top armies, but I think it's fairly safe to say that they're not going to be doing that anymore. I'd say the single most important thing is the really massive points nerfs that they got. Just about every strong Tyranid data sheet got targeted, and a lot of them went up by really quite a lot. Warriors got war gear nerfs, Raveners went up to 45 the Turvagon went up to 235, the Flying Hive Tyrant went up a good number of points as well, the Harpy's Heavy Venom Cannons went up, and the Fly Changes mean that it has to start off the board as well, making it just into a much worse unit, the Tyranifex and the Carnifex went up, Zonethropes went up to a massive 70 points, Neurothropes went up slightly, though I think they're still good, Venomthropes went up to 40 points each, though I think they're still usable for the minus one to hit. Tyrant Guard went up slightly, so a bit more premium for protecting the leaders of the swarm. And for some reason, the Hive Guard, Old One-Eye and Trigons all went up, despite not exactly being standout units in the first place, at least in my opinion. GW definitely haven't been gentle with these points nerfs, and then the backs is up with a bunch of fairly rough rules changes as well. Overrun now applies to core units, so you can't use it to jump your big winged Hive Tyrant in and out of Tyrant Guard. As mentioned, the Flyer changes affect the Harpy. Biovore, Spore Assist and the Harpy are further hit by having to pay for reinforcement points for their Spore Mines, which is basically never going to be worth it at the 10 point cost. And then another couple of small things, they can't take any Gene Stealer Cult as allies even if they want to, and their secondary has got a small nerf to Cranial Feasting and Psychic Interrogation. 
I feel like even just a few of these changes would have been a fairly big deal for the Tyranids, but having them all at once makes me think that they're going to be on the lower end of mid-tier, if not lower. They are a big codex that's had multiple good data sheets though, I guess it's not impossible that they still might wind up being mid-tierish, but I feel like they're definitely out of the top spot now. They did gain perhaps a few advantages from Arcs of Omen, they can just ignore their troops choices if desired now, but to be honest after all the nerfs, things like Hormagaunts in Gorgon and things might not be the worst option. You can run multiple Hive Tyrants in one detachment for just one command point extra now, perhaps still a winged one with the Reaper, and perhaps a walking one with a shooting relic might be reasonable. Speaking of which, the Reaper of Litterax has interestingly picked up a buff from this, as the ignore damage thing now actually applies to damage modifiers as well, when it didn't before. Overall though, this really is a heavy blow from the nerf hammer, and definitely rate the Tyranids as coming off single worst out of all of these changes. Both the points cost, the spore mine thing, overrun and flyer changes are all big deals to the army. Moving on, and here we have a bunch of factions that I'd rate as slightly worse, maybe not hit quite as hard as the first three, but kind of coming off second best in my opinion. Here I've chosen to rank the Thousand Sons, Tau Empire, Drukhari, Grey Knights, Demons, Sisters of Battle, and Leagues of Votan. First up we've got the Thousand Sons, which I feel like had perhaps one of the roughest deals of this lot, might be slightly on the borderline between being on this section and the one lower down. Prior to the updates, they were fairly solidly as a mid-tier army, around about a 49% win rate, durable terminators and rubrics potentially backed up by some allied flamers. The Thousand Sons have picked up some positives out of Arcs of Omen, they did get a few points changes go their way, a decrease to the Mutalith Vortex Beast, the Zangor Shaman and Spawn, plus a fair bit of free war gear on some characters, vehicles and squads. Overall though, I don't think that these points changes quite outweigh the damage done by losing Armour of Contempt. This was really quite big for the faction stacking with all this dust. Both the Rubric Marines and the Terminators got on very well with it. Otherwise, for slightly more good stuff, I guess it's really quite easy to spam things with a Thousand Suns now. You could rather spam Endless Rubrique in loads of units of 5 to get crazy amounts of casts and cabalistic rituals, or just go a list entirely focusing on Terminators with objective secured and ignore troops altogether. 4 HQ slots certainly doesn't hurt with the Thousand Suns being so focused on their sorcerers, and allied war dogs or demon patrols both are pretty tempting, maybe particularly the war dogs for a little bit of long range fire, though I feel like still the Zinch Psychers are probably interesting enough to field with their big witch fire damage. Otherwise though, in terms of bad things, we've already talked about Armour of Contempt, that really is a big deal, but I did feel that Allied Flamers were kind of propping up the Codex a bit. I don't think they're unusable now they have to roll to hit, but definitely took a big power hit, and aren't going to be quite as much of a crotch unit as they were before. It does seem that the Psychic Secondaries are also a fair bit weaker overall, the Thousand Suns also lost Wrath of Magnus entirely, and that one in both of its incarnations was quite useful, the latest one quite good for bullying an individual enemy Psyche. Overall, I would say that the Thousand Sons have come out of this fairly badly, a mid-tier army that was doing okay, but has basically been hit by a whole faction toughness nerf, and combining that with worse secondaries really isn't a good combo. It would have been quite nice to see a points cut for Magnus as well, I feel like he could have afforded to go down a little bit more. Moving onwards, we come to the Tower Empire. Again, these were one of the factions that were doing fairly well prior to the changes, around about a 52% win rate, and doing really quite well on the top tables of grand tournaments, often placing high. In general, for the majority of the changes, I feel like the Tau have come off this second best. They do have a few positives, such as being able to completely ignore troops' choices now, when they usually took them in slightly low numbers anyway. I feel like a few lists might think about running small squads of crude hounds as opposed to their carnivores. Multiple commanders seem pretty much auto-include in most lists, one command point extra for the heroic support, it does mean that Tau lists can run two commanders without having to buy in extra patrols or things. I guess strategic reserves might not be the worst thing either for them. If they can't hide some valuable things like hammerheads, then having them turn up on turn two might not be terrible. In terms of the targeted changes to the 8th faction though, then in general it's really not good news. They've had a few key points or rules nerfs to some of their best units. Crisis suits and commanders both went up a little bit more. Probably still just about worth it, but they're really starting to push it and you really have to build into their synergies now. Standard ethereals also went up a bit, maybe making Ornvar look a little bit better as a result. And Kroot got nerfed to 7 points for no apparent reason. People weren't exactly spamming them before, and now you don't have to take troops, I feel like people just won't. Otherwise, I guess that Farsight Enclaves have arguably had a small nerf in that the Tau Seps can now take multiple commanders fairly easily. I feel like that was one of the main incentives to play them so now they're perhaps going to look a bit worse as a result. Sunshark Bombers are really going to hate the flyer change, 
It means they can't do bombing alpha strikes turn one. I feel like people aren't generally going to want to take those now, and they were a competitive staple of the army. Also on a bit of a flavour note, I was a bit sad to see no allied leagues of Votan despite the Imperium getting them. I'm not necessarily sure that it would have even added all that much power, but I think it would have been fun. Overall, I feel like the tower being hit by a few choice nerfs, but maybe nothing too overpowering. Their good lists were doing kind of okay before. I feel like maybe you might see a few more Riptides and Hammerheads as a result of these changes, and probably far less Sun Sharks and Crude. Moving on, we've got the Drukhari, who I was kind of debating between putting here or putting with the armies that I think haven't changed too much. I'd probably argue that they've perhaps lost a little bit more than they've gained, though. Since Drukhari dominated the meta in 2021, Games Workshop nerfed them quite a bit. They've been kind of balanced since then, at around about a 48% win rate, doing okay but no longer one of the top dogs. The changes to Arcs of Omen were maybe fairly small for Drukhari. They got a small points buff to Witches and Beastmasters, plus the Forge World Reapers and Tantalus as well. Harlequin patrols are command point free now, though admittedly the units within them got nerfed a bit, so it might be a little bit less tempting as a result, and they reverted a minor nerf to the Witch Cult Agile Hunters, which had a small speed nerf for some reason. I feel like perhaps their biggest downside from all of this though, is that it doesn't look like they've got any sort of FAQ change to their army building mechanics. Games Workshop did say that they'd give them something to represent their multiple patrol options, but so far they don't seem to have had any FAQ to represent that, and it looks like if you want to run Drukhari with multiple different options in the same detachment, then you're going to be going a real space raid, unless you want to take some sort of big skew list that's all covens or something. I feel like the real space raid is fine, but it is a bit annoying to have your nominated warlord have to be the Archon. I'd hope that at some stage they might well be releasing an FAQ to mean that the patrols thing is go once more. Otherwise, they got a small points nerf to Rax and Homunculi. The Rax went up 1 and the Homunculus went up 10, both a bit less efficient than they were, not unusable, but taking a bit of the shine off some of the better units in the book. Another nerf that I think is at least fairly important is that they'll lose the Cult of Strife supplement that they had. There were some good options and stratagems in there, and a good build for a succubus. Kind of sad to see that one go. Overall, currently out of those changes, I'd say that the supplement, the army building restrictions, and the nerf to racks probably outweighs the points buffs to the witches. Not by a whole load though, I feel like Drukhari are generally going to be in a pretty similar place to where they were before after these changes. Next up we've got the Grey Knights, who I feel like Games Workshop haven't been enormously kind to in this update. I feel like the updates when taken as a whole represent at best a side grade, and probably a little bit weaker overall. Really not great seeing as they were coming from a win rate of around about 43% certainly on the weaker end of the 40k spectrum. Admittedly, they have received a fair few points buffs in the Codex. The HQs dropped a little, as did Strike Marines, Terminators, Interceptors, and Purgation Squads, and a fair few units got free gear. I feel like the points buffs are helpful enough, but for a fair few units, I feel like all this does is kind of balance the fact that Armour of Contempt has gone away, and things like Strike Marines being two points off just aren't really any stronger as a result. They've just pivoted to being a bit more glass cannon, a bit more hitty, but a bit less tanky. In general, losing Armour of Contempt, I think, is quite bad for the Grey Knights as well, because it stacks very nicely with the Tide of Shadows, that gave you a nice helpful light cover at range, and it perhaps particularly affects the Paladins as well, which didn't see any sort of base points cut, and it was a fairly good competitive staple to have a unit of them with Armoured Resilience and Armour of Contempt being very hard to remove from the board. Dread Knights won't be affected by the Armour of Contempt nerf, but it's not like they got any better either. They're just the same points as they were before, and at least a fair few lists were choosing not to take them as they considered most of the infantry a bit better. Otherwise, besides points and armour of contempt, I guess things like allied armages might well help them out. I guess Helverins in particular will be quite nice for a bit of long range fire, and for secondaries it's kind of a mixed bag. They did get some help with a big buff to their teleport assault one, though some of the secondaries also got worse as well. The psychic secondaries generally need higher casts now, and you need line of sights for mental interrogation. I'd also say that Grey Knights are perhaps an army where the Arcs of Omen rules just don't really help them out that much. Strategic reserves don't really matter as they can mainly teleport, and I feel like they were fairly well able to take the units that they wanted to in a battalion already. I guess maybe you might see a few lists taking a few less strike marines, but I don't think that they're a particularly bad choice in the troop slot. A few units of them to act as a counter charge with hammer hands was kind of fine. Overall, I'd probably rate Grey Knights as slightly having lost out, but not massively. I certainly don't think that they're going to be gaining any massive ground on the other factions though with this update, which is a bit disappointing for them, because I don't think that they were doing amazingly well against the field already. There were only a few armies that they were decently better at, and I feel like Space Marines and Ab Maker probably both easily surpassed them with their big buffs. 
I guess at least they fixed that Demon Slayer Warlord trait. That'll help out in one matchup, I suppose. Talking of which, next up we have the Chaos Demons. Unlike the Grey Knights, these guys were doing absolutely great. A very good win rate, around about 55% or so in Nephilim. Though a fair amount of that, I think, was carried by the absolutely insanely powerful Flamers of Zinch. Chaos Demons have taken a fair few hits. Flamers now no longer auto hits, which is a fairly solid nerf to their damage output, but also means they aren't Kings of Overwatch anymore either. I feel like they're actually still not bad though, they'd still be usable in lists, but no longer auto includes. Otherwise, they got some small points nerfs to the Lord of Change, the Fate Skimmer, and the Bloodthirst upgrades to have him take no more than 8 wounds. And again, perhaps like the Grey Knights, I feel like they didn't gain an enormous amount from being able to take Arcs of Omen detachments. Perhaps the biggest thing being able to spam a few more HQs without having to resort to multiple detachments. The demons do have a fair amount of usable ones, I suppose. Otherwise, though, the demons did get a fair amount of decent points buffs. I'd say maybe most notably to things like Flesh Hounds and Beasts, both of which were kind of fine already. Beyond that, though, a whole load of maybe slightly weaker stuff got buffed. Things like Blood Crushers, Skull Cannons, Great Unclean ones. Plague Bearers, Horrors, Plague Drones, Screamers, Seekers, and Fiends. Really quite some wide-ranging points cuts, but I feel like most of these units just weren't that great already. I'm not sure that most of these are going to be standout as a result. In general, the secondaries were okay, and they broadly stayed the same. War Dogs being allied again might help them out for a bit of firepower if they want them. Very nice to have those for 0 CP. And as mentioned, it is quite nice to be able to spam multiple HQs. Overall though, despite the buffs that they got, I probably would say that Demons as a whole are going to be slightly weaker after this. Flamers of Zinch were just absolutely amazing, and having them toned down is going to bring the faction down just a touch. Even with those points buffs, the best of those units just don't reach their godly level. Overall though, I feel like Demons are still going to be decently strong. They've had a small nerf, but we're starting from a very good place. It's quite nice that the Codex might have a fair bit more internal balance now, with a whole bunch of lesser used datasheets getting buffed. Moving on, we've got the Sisters of Battle. Maybe they were in a similar sort of place power-wise to the Demons before the update. A win rate of around about 55%. A fairly hard army to beat in Nephilim with some very punchy units. Overall, and perhaps slightly more solidly than some of the other armies in this section, I do feel they've been nerfed. Kind of like the Chaos Space Marines, they're an army that's lost Armour of Contempt, but haven't really got any sort of wide-ranging points cuts to make up for that. It is going to hit some of their units pretty hard, most of their infantry, and perhaps those Paragon Warsuits as well. A few units did get some minor points cuts, a couple of tanks and the Mortifier, though I feel like these are a bit of a side grade again, and kind of just compensate for the Armour of Contempt's loss. Otherwise, they got a small nerf to Repenture, going from 14 to 16. Still usable, but a bit less good. Maybe we'll compete just a little bit worse with things like Zephyrim now. Otherwise, in terms of nerfs, their secondaries were toned down a little bit, but still remain usable for the most part. They lost a supplement with Armata Lady, though the Bloody Rose one is still remaining in play. That's probably the more important one competitively. And I'd say they did get a few benefits from jumping into Arcs of Omen, I feel like they're one of the armies that will quite happily run absolutely zero troopers whatsoever and focus all on their elite damage dealers. And I feel like they will quite like the strategic reserve changes. It can be quite nice for having Repentia just turn up on the flanks and then make a very long charge with Miracle Dice. Overall, between a Repentia nerf, Armour of Contempt going and the secondaries being a little bit worse, I do feel that the sisters are going to be less powerful than they were before. They still look like they'll be playable though. I'd say a bit more in the mid tier. Still going to be very good having some scary units jumping out and blasting stuff to death before getting killed. Next up, we've got the updated cloned squats of the Leagues of Votan. Prior to this, they were doing very, very well as well. Around about a 55% win rate in Nephilim, even despite all the nerfs that they got day one on their codex. Games Workshop have basically threw a few more nerfs their way. Probably the most important changes landing towards their HQ section, which I thought was very, very strong previously. The Karl Grimnir and Einherr Champion all cost more. Otherwise, there were some small nerfs to the Chthonian Berserks, Land Fortress, and the Halfkin Warriors, none of which are particularly devastating, I think, but they really are starting to take the shine off those units, particularly combined with the previous ones they had. Overall, I think that that realistically means that the Leagues of Votan will be taking a power cut overall, but there is some good news as well. The Brockier Thunderkin went down to 35 points again. That'll have them competing just a little bit better with the other units. Maybe some beams turning up from Strategic Reserve could actually be quite fun. The Hernkin Pioneers as well somehow escaped any nerfs despite being arguably one of the strongest units in the Codex. Fast objective secured bikes that can get line of sight on what they want and help hand out judgement tokens. I feel like a lot of lists are probably going to just completely ditch Hearthkin Warriors now, particularly with the points increase and switch to spamming a whole bunch of those bikes. 
I think at least having the option to put all four HQs on the board is pretty cool as well, but maybe just a little bit less exciting than it was before, seeing as a few went up in cost. Finally, I would bear in mind that Leagues of Votan are now the only faction with an Armour of Contempt equivalent. I feel like a whole load of armies are going to switch back to using a whole bunch of AP-1 weapons, and that's going to be something that won't be anywhere near as effective against them. It also helps their low AP weapons out against Space Marines and things. That certainly won't hurt. Overall, I would rate them as slightly worse due to the points changes, though really not that much. I still feel they're going to be able to compete well enough and probably win some events. They'll still fairly hard counter certain factions like Knights and perhaps Custodes, and if they do match up against armies with loads of AP-1, they'll be in a good place there too. Moving onwards and upwards, here are the armies that I feel have actually got fairly even in terms of buffs and nerfs. Definitely some downsides and things that Games Workshop have reined in, but also other things that they've gained either from the core rules changes or other buffs that they've given them. So I'd guess that they're probably not going to change in terms of power level all that much. Here I've chosen to rank the Death Guard, the Craft Worlds and the Necrons. First up, we've got the Diseased Plague Marines of the Death Guard. Again, an army that was probably on the slightly lower end of 40k power scales. I would have rated them low mid-tier before, a win rate of around about 46% in Nephilim. I feel like Death Guard got a bit of a mixed bag here. They lost Armour of Contempt, the same as Thousand Sons, Sisters and Chaos. But unlike Thousand Sons in particular, the Death Guard do seem to have actually got some fairly decent points buffs on a few of their key units, perhaps Plague Marines in particular. Overall, in terms of good stuff from the update, Play Marines went down to 19 points, and even without Armour of Contempt, that's still going to be pretty hard to slog through. You could be spamming loads of them in the Arcs of Omen Detachment if you want, and their damage output is pretty good for the points. A bunch of their characters went down, as did a fair few Demon Engines, plus a decent amount of free gear appears on Terminators and some vehicles. On top of that, their secondary objectives got a fair bit better. Spread the Sickness still probably seems best, but at least the others are a bit more usable than they were. And again, like the other Chaos factions, I feel like Easy Allies is going to be quite nice for a few more options. A bit more firepower to back up the Plague Burst Crawlers with War Dogs or Demon Patrols now the Nurgle Demons went down in cost might be a bit more interesting. I feel like despite those buffs, there's no real getting around that losing Armour of Contempt is pretty big for the Death Guard though. They're basically a faction that just lives and dies on its durability, quite literally. Losing Armour of Contempt is definitely going to make the Terminators a little bit less appealing, but I feel like a lot of points buffs on the rest of the things make it just feel like Death Guard are just a little bit more dangerous, but a little bit less tough, so I don't think it's an insurmountable nerf. Some other minor disadvantages are losing the Terminus S Strike Force though, that's kind of sad for people who just wanted to run endless zombies, which would have been quite good in this new detachment. And I guess for the few weapons that ignore wound mitigation, then that's going to work against Death Guard now. Things like that Golax weapon and the Reaper of Obliterax will ignore minus one damage effects. Overall, I'd probably say that the Death Guard didn't really either win or lose big, but that's probably not great news for a faction that was kind of struggling just a little bit before. At least a small power boost would have been nice. I perhaps feel that it's got even further into pushing you into taking Plague Marines as well, which maybe isn't so amazing for the Codex's balance, which wasn't too bad before. Moving on, we've got the Craftworld Eldar, or the Eldari, whatever you want to call them. Overall, I'd probably rate them as a fairly mid-tier faction that's going to be remain so, even though Games Workshop did hit them with a fair few points nerfs. Prior to the update, they were around about on a 50% win percentage, though a lot of that was carried and boosted by Inari, which were the doing best out of their sub-factions. I do feel like Arcs of Omen is a bit of a mixed bag for them overall. For the obvious negatives, they've had some points nerfs to some really key units, all their psychers went up just a little bit, the Farseers and the Warlocks. They're still pretty much auto-include, so that just means that lists are going to be taking a few less points of other stuff. And Swooping Hawks went up quite significantly, with all their shenanigans jumping on and off the board and not getting shot. The Webway Gaze went up a little bit, perhaps to pay for easier strategic reserves. And for some reason they decided to nerf Wraith Guard as well, because Games Workshop just likes to do arbitrary things sometimes. Otherwise, it's still really not great news on their secondary objectives either. They were weak and they got absolutely no help at all really. Definitely an area that they could have made just a little bit easier for the Eldar. And as a further downside, Psychic Interrogation got a bit harder to do as well, needing line of sight and costing more warp charge. Both of those things are pretty annoying and aren't going to help them, but they did have some things that help out. Shroud Runners and Dark Reapers both got a bit better. Shroud Runners were kind of usable already, so making them cheaper is nice. Dark Reapers are kind of bad. I feel like now they're a bit more mid-tier, but still not exactly exciting. I'd say maybe one of the single best buffs that the Eldar got, though, is that the Arcs of Omen Detachment means that you can just completely ignore troops. 
Probably would have been good for Games Workshop to give the Eldar some points cuts on their Rangers and Storm Guardians and things, but in absence of that, I feel like craft world lists are just going to take almost zero troops whatsoever. And if you did want some absolutely minimal investment obsec, you could use some Corsairs, I guess. Now they don't fill mandatory slots, they are an option. Otherwise, Fire and Fade being able to be used multiple times a game is pretty handy. It still will require investment though with CP, so you will be trading that out for something else. Strategic reserves are handy enough for units turning up on the flanks. Could be nice for dealing alpha strikes with things like shuriken weapons with dire avengers or having units spring out of the webway. And the harlequin patrol is now command point free as well if you want to take some travelling players along, though their units did get worse. Overall, I feel like these positives probably balance out with the points nerfs on the negatives. Realistically, I feel like craft world lists are probably going to change a bit with taking basically no troops and a few more points of something else, though a bit less points of something else than they would have due to the points nerfs on their psychers. Finally, for the armies that got some good things and some bad things, we've got the Necrons. Prior to this, they were doing kind of well, around about a 52% win rate in Nephilim, not one of the top factions of the game quite, they were certainly holding their own, though I think they were definitely carried pretty hard by their objective secured army trait and their secondaries. I feel like Games Workshop addressed Necrons really quite well, to be honest, make their units better, but make their objectives a bit worse. I feel like it's a bit more healthy rather than basically forcing all players to have to try and go for and table the Necrons as quick as possible before they just outscore you to death. Starting out with the objective nerfs, the big one was to Eternal Conquerors, which you can no longer pair with the pre-game move dynasty thing. You can still get basically army-wide obsec, but you have to go Nihilac now, which isn't terrible as it does get you some durability too, but I feel like it is just a little bit weaker. Losing the pre-game moves will have a knock-on effect on their secondaries as well, which a couple of them basically mean that you want to be taking multiple objectives in the midfield as soon as possible. Speaking of which, all their secondaries were toned down a little bit and one has gone entirely. I feel like Necrons aren't just going to be wanting to easy 100 point victories anymore. Code of Combat was pretty handy with the Silent King, and Purge the Vermin in particular looks like it's a lot worse, basically missing out on a bunch of free points that it would usually get turn 1. To balance out with all that though, Games Workshop did give them rather a lot of points cuts. I'd say probably the pick of them were two Necron Warriors going down to 11 points, they seem pretty solid now. Tomb Blades going down to 18, which are just very efficient, and otherwise for some bigger heavier Necron units than Monolith and the Ghost and Doomsday arc both look a bit more interesting. There's also drops for Death Marks, Triarch Praetorians, the Triarch Stalker, Obelisk, Tesseract Vault, and some Forge World units, and also the Convergence of Dominion, though that does still remain pretty rubbish. I feel like the Warriors and the Tomb Blades are maybe the biggest changes, though you certainly could ignore Necron troops altogether if you wanted to, and just focus on damage dealers like Destroyers or fast-moving Wraiths, though with Warriors dropping like that, I feel like lots of lists are still going to run them in numbers. Just in general, the Arcs of Omen Detachment is going to be a bit freeing for them. If you want to take absolutely tons of fast attack with Wraiths and Tomb Blades and Scarabs, then it won't compromise any CP. Otherwise, you can take multiple Katarn for an extra CP. No triple Katarn lists, but unlocking the second is easier. Armor of Contempt going away is pretty helpful for a bunch of units. Warriors with Gauss Flayers and Gauss Reapers will be nice, plus any Gauss Flayers on the edges of Ghost Arcs. The Strategic Reserve changes could be interesting enough when combined with Prismatic Dimensional Breach as well, potentially out of a Monolith or a Night Scythe coming in from Reserve. Overall, I'd say between the changes, the Necrons are probably fairly even. I still think that they're going to be at least fairly strong on objectives. Most factions don't have army-wide obsec, and that's still a big deal in Nihilac. Plus, having warriors being more efficient is another way that you can get bodies on objectives, and also have a bit more muscle at blasting people off with Gauss Reapers. Overall, broadly good changes for the Necrons. I'm not sure that they're going to be top tier or anything, but probably will still be a pretty solid mid-tier faction. Moving on, we're now getting into the winners of the update in earnest. I'd rank these factions as getting slightly better overall, though maybe not the biggest beneficiaries of the rules updates. Here I've chosen to rank Gene Steeler Colts, Imperial and Chaos Knights, Adeptus Custodes, Orcs, and Astra Militarum. I've decided I'll include the Guard Codex here, even though by Games Workshop's reckoning it's still not officially on sale yet, so I guess even at this point it's still not technically recommended for match play. They really need to release this thing. First up, we've got the many limbed forces of the Four-Armed Emperor. Gene Steeler Colt have been a fairly middling army since the Codex came out, capable of punching up a bit, though not being overpowered at any point. In Nephilim, they were around about a 47% win rate, though I would say a harder army to play, and you needed to play quite smart and keep them hidden. Broadly speaking, I'd say it's good news for the Colts in the new Arcs of Omen. The detachment means that you can spam a few more troops if you want to, 
no running into caps on battalions and things if you want lots of neophytes and acolytes in the list both of those are pretty efficient and they got some cheaper gear now Actually having some proper Brood Brothers rules updated to fit in with the Guard Codex is pretty handy. The Guard Book is pretty powerful, and not paying any command points to access those data sheets is rather nice. Getting a few Colt Lehman Rosses on the go seems reasonable. Otherwise, besides the points buffs for the war gear, they've got quite a lot of other small drops. A whole bunch of their characters went down, including the Primus, who was a bit of a staple in competitive lists, but also a few lesser taken things like the Locus and Reductus Saboteur. It'll be quite nice to see a few more aberrants and abominants on the table. I feel like they'll catch up a fair bit more now that at 27 points, and the Jackal's got a bit of a side grade, getting a bit more expensive but getting war gear free. Finally, their secondary has got a little bit of good news as well. Their ambush one got a little bit better, and their brood swarm one is still very good and was unchanged. I'd say perhaps the biggest downside for the Gene Stealer Colts is that there's going to be no doubling up on characters now. You can't game your way into having multiple Kellermorphs, for example, with a couple of different patrols. You are just getting one of each of these character bioforms now. Overall, I'd say that the Gene Stealer Colts are doing pretty well out of the Arcs of Omen update. A whole bunch of small and helpful changes, small points cuts, and secondary buffs. Perhaps not quite as earth-shattering points drops or things compared with armies like Admech, but they were starting out from at least an okay place before, and I feel like they'll be in quite a good spot now. Moving on to the big stompy robots, and first up we have the Imperial Knights. They've been consistently quite threatening since their book dropped, a 52% win rate in Nephilim. By their nature as a skew list, they maybe do have some matchups that they do very well, and some that they do badly against, like Guard, Tyranids, and Botan. For the most part, they didn't have any massive changes going into Arcs of Omen. Their points stayed the same, and so did their secondaries, besides losing it probably the worst one, but I feel like a bunch of the game rules changing will actually help them quite a bit. Free strategic reserves is really quite a nice option for knights, usually they'd be a bit expensive to pay the CP for, but now you can afford to hide really big units off the board if you need to, and you think that you're just going to get alpha struck to death if you don't. Allied Imperial Agents could be interesting enough to allow things like raise the banners and secondaries that you wouldn't be able to do. You could take an Inquisitor for mental interrogation if you wanted to, I suppose. It is quite nice just to have some expendable units to sit on objectives and things if you didn't feel like it was necessary to commission an entire knight to them. The secondaries being untouched, I think, are generally a good thing, as the knight ones were generally very strong. Honor the house, yield no grounds, and renew the oaths are all very usable. And if they had to remove one, then the Jewel of Honor one was probably the one to go for. Arcs of Omen gives them a bit better army construction. It means that you can take any combination of knights that you want to, rather than not having to do certain combos with Dominus knights. And I think technically you're able to run basically seven different slots of knights now if you want to. You get six slots base, and you could still take an allied free blade unit. Otherwise, Armagers have got a few more options to gain some CP from the book secondaries. And I feel like knights and perhaps custodies were about in the place in the meta where they were just below the armies that got big nerfs. Armour of Contempt going will help them. Tyranids being probably a lot less popular will be good for them. Though I feel like going into Arcs of Omen, both the Leagues of Votan and the Imperial Guards will be out in good force, and that won't be so good for the big knights. Finally, they did have a small rules clarification to calculated targeting, confirming that the minus one damage does affect the mortal wounds that that comes out with, if you're farming out a whole bunch of mortal wounds with a crusader or something. Not exactly the biggest change though, and it does seem like a reasonable ruling. Overall though, it seems like a pretty good time to run knights. They're a pretty good army that overall just got a little bit better, and a lot of their biggest rivals got nerfed. In general, I feel like the story is fairly similar for the Knights of the Dark Gods as well. In general, in Nephilim, they've been doing a little bit worse than the Imperial Knights, around a 48% win rate as opposed to 52, but still a pretty solid mid-tier army. For the most part, a lot of the changes that help out the Imperials will help out them. Things like strategic reserves, the Arcs of Omen detachment being less restrictive, a few nerfs to some of their main rivals, and war dogs having the opportunity to gain some CP. Again, like the Imperial Knights, they didn't get any major points changes or anything. Would have been nice to do something to help out some of the worst Forge World ones, I suppose. But the Chaos Knights broadly did get some pretty nice help to their secondary objectives. Just generally across the board, they're either easier to score, more victory points, or both. This is definitely going to be a power boost for them. Compared with the Imperial Knights, their secondaries weren't as good, so it's quite nice that they're getting a bit of help. Otherwise, though, in a problem that the Imperial Knights don't have quite as much, these guys have lost access to some rather good allies that they had in the last season. It was perhaps weirdly common to see Abaddon the Despoiler heading up a big army full of war dogs. The combo worked quite well. Now you won't be able to take him. And for some reason, Games Workshop have decided to stop knights using demon patrols as well. 
Maybe seems a little bit odd considering the Chaos Space Marines can use them, and particularly as the Imperials can use the Imperial agents to get some infantry on the go on their part. Overall though, mainly due to the secondary objectives, but the strategic reserves and easier detachments both help. I do feel like the Chaos Knights have gained a bit of power out of this, and I suspect we'll catch up at least a little bit of ground on the Imperials as a result. Next up, and perhaps for an army that was in a sort of similar place to Knights in terms of wins, the Adeptus Custodians I think have done rather well out of this whole update. They were winning around about 51% in tournament games before, though rather depend on only using at least a few Forge World Dreadnoughts to carry them there. In general though, they weren't in a terrible place at all, they were winning some tournaments, and in this update, Games Workshop have been pretty kind to them, giving them a few big buffs. First up, they've undone one of the nerfs to their stratagems, meaning that they can use three key stratagems multiple times a game again. They're all pretty great. Esteemed Amalgam and Martial Discretion just means that any squad can pop up a whole multitude of special rules if they happen to be in the right situation. It gives you a lot of flexibility with the army. And also the Emperor's Auspice is a really powerful defensive stratagem turning off enemy rerolls. If the enemy's got some powerful buffing characters, then that can save you a lot of damage. On top of that, a bunch of their infantry units got a fair bit better. Objective secured was gained by the Wardens, Alarus, and the Venatari Custodians. All of those now compete a lot better with the standard Custodian Guard as a result, and the Venatari might be a bit more common winging around with some Virtus Praetors. Objective secured with jump packs is pretty cool. I feel like the Custodians are perhaps one of the armies that will really get on very well with allied armagers. The Armager Helverins in particular look like they'd compete pretty well with the Caladius tank for some fire support. Slightly different damage outputs, but they're both fairly generalists and will be happy shooting at most things. And the Helverins are pretty nice at getting objectives secured and fired models as well. I think the Custodians will be certainly quite happy to see Armour of Contempt going away. Now they don't have to complain that they don't have it. And if Space Marines do return as one of the stronger factions in the game, then Custodians generally do quite well against Space Marines. They've got a lot of damage to weapons, and AP-1 with the Auric weapons will actually be quite effective. Beyond that, Sisters of Silence got some small points cuts, though nothing massive, and many of their rivals got nerfed hard, as we've already talked about. In general, it's really quite positive news for the Custodies. Not that much has gone wrong for them in this update. I guess perhaps one of the biggest weaknesses of the army is still perhaps the secondaries. I guess Games Workshop decided to make no changes to them, as they were already doing okay in events and things. But I would say that the Custodies ones are kind of bad. Really quite swingy depending on whether you kill a certain unit or get first or second turn. Just theoretically though, I could also see them actually struggling for elite slots in the new detachment. If you get six and you want to spam out loads of dreadnoughts, it means that you'd actually have to think about using them versus terminators. Overall though, it does look like this is going to be a fairly comfortable power boost to the Custodies. I feel like they're going to be one of the stronger factions in the game after this whole update. They were fairly competent before and they've got a little bit better. Moving on, we've got the Greenskin Horde of the Orcs. Before Arcs of Omen, I would have rated Orcs kind of lower middle tier. They had a 47% win rate, though I feel like their army builds weren't really all that varied, often having to run certain units in goths to get those kind of results. Broadly speaking, I say they've gained a lot more than they've lost in the update. They can spam a few more troops now, so if you want to put a bunch of Gretchen on the board, it's not going to cost you CP. They are quite good just for hoovering up those secondaries and aren't terrible bullet sponges at 40 points. They got a few points buffs, including some drops to flash kits and killer cans and some orc war gear too. I wouldn't say that their points changes are anything particularly groundbreaking though. Maybe things like killer cans might be a bit more tempting. Being able to field multiple war bosses in the same detachment is kind of handy. One CP to field an extra one, though that second boss will be competing against Gazgul Thracker. No extra Supreme Command attachment means that you can't take him plus two bosses. It's either one boss and him or two other bosses. Armor of Contempt going, I think, is broadly a very good thing for the Orcs. They've got a whole load of weapons with low AP, particularly things like the Orc Chopper's AP minus one. So boys and beast snagger boys are going to be a bit more tempting as a result. They'll be a bit more dangerous if they're going into things like Terminators or Primaris Marines. Otherwise, strategic reserves could be kind of handy for vehicles. Maybe use an outflanking vehicle and then use ramming speed to get it into combat. And the secondary has got some small but helpful improvements. That good bits one, which was already fairly decent, that one got better with more victory points, and the greed tied one now is a little bit easier to get in those table quarters. In general, a whole bunch of minor improvements that I think will help the orcs. Perhaps the biggest downsides are their specialist mobs only being one per detachment. It means that you'd have to choose between truck boys and horrible gits a bit more. Their flyers have got to start off the board, and the Daka jets and the was bomb blaster jet were both pretty decent. No more alpha strikes for them, it's big beta strikes at best, and they did lose some supplemental content, 
the Speed Mob and the Blood Axe Codex Supplement. Both of those are now history in terms of matched play. I did feel like it was a bit of a flavour loss to lose those two, to be honest. Neither of them were really optimal Orc lists, but if you decided to build around them, they could push your force in a couple of different ways. It was quite nice to see Mad Max Orcs getting some proper tailored rule support. Overall though, I think it amounts to a small but meaningful power increase. Maybe Orcs will be climbing up to a bit more solidly mid-tier, as opposed to lower mid-tier. I probably feel like it, this isn't quite enough though to get them into being one of the top lists in 40k. Finally, for the armies that have received slight or medium-sized improvements, we've got the Imperial Guard. Still a bit of a curious case, seeing as they've only had their codex released from that Cadia Stands box set at time of recording. Games Workshop will hopefully have the actual proper release of them pre-ordering soon. As a result, we don't really have a win rate for what they've been doing so far. The tournament data mixes the old and the new codex a fair bit, but broadly speaking, I'd say that they're looking very strong indeed, particularly carried by powerful data sheets like the Lehman Ross, Kazakin, Lord Solar and Sentinels. I feel like Arcs of Omen is largely a case of no news is good news for the Imperial Guard. They are going to be let out of the bag just as powerful as their codex was written, unlike the Votan. And for some reason on top of that, they do seem to have picked up a few buffs as well. Their secondary objectives got a bit better. For some reason, Games Workshop gave both Boots on the Ground and Inflexible Command a solid buff, even though both of those I thought were very easy objectives to score already. With that change to the things that ignore damage caps and modifiers, the finial of the Nembradesh first standard has also got crazily powerful for the guard. It was already a pretty spectacular buff to core shooting, it meant that you got to ignore modifiers, damage caps and feel no pains, but now it's going to ignore things like minus one damage as well, so it's going to plough straight through things like death guard disgustingly resilient, or it's going to be great against dreadnoughts. The Arcs of Omen detachment does allow a decent amount of spam as well, you could be throwing really quite a lot of sentinels or a load of heavy support down the table, and you wouldn't have to compromise the amount of infantry squads that you can take as well, as you'd still have the option of 9. It is pretty good that they actually thought to think about scions as well, and you can take an allied detachment of them, so you can still have troop 10 pester scions if that's a way you want to go. I feel like strategic reserves also have some decent potential for the guard, you could potentially keep some Lehman Rosses that you couldn't hide off the boards to get a second strike, and it's a lot more usable for cheap units that you might not have bothered with otherwise. Having some cheap infantry turn up to skirmish with the enemy's own objective holders might not be the worst. In general, it's broadly very good news, I think. Perhaps the biggest negative is Armour of Contempt and the Barrage Exemption being gone from the data slate, though Games Workshop have basically told us that that was happening already. I feel like not getting the exemption into the barrage nerf that they had does mean that guard artillery is just a little bit lacking compared with what it might be. It feels like it's not the strongest element of the codex, though I'd still say it's got enough power to be usable in small numbers. Overall, I'd rate the update for guard being spawn but meaningful improvements to an already absolutely great codex. Plenty of the other strong armies in Warhammer 40k were nerfed very hard. I'd guess that the Astra Militara are probably going to be one of the strongest factions in the game in Arcs of Omen, at least when it drops. Finally, we get up to the armies that I think have improved the most out of this whole update, and here I'd rank Space Marines and the Adeptus Mechanicus. I'd argue that both of these were probably the worst armies in Warhammer 40k prior to the update, and Games Workshop really has given them quite a lot of love here, some very big points increases, and some rule buffs as well. I don't think that every Space Marine chapter has necessarily increased equally, but to keep them all together, we'll talk through them here, and some of their advantages and disadvantages. So first up, Space Marines and Admech were pretty much vying for the weakest factions in the game in Nephilim. The win rate for Space Marine Codex chapters was around about 37%, with a few of the more varied successors doing a bit better than that. It is kind of interesting that Games Workshop decided to take away Armour of Contempt from Space Marines, seeing as that was a faction-wide buff that gave them some good durability. But basically what they've decided to do is take that away, but give them some pretty massive points changes as a result. Unlike Death Guard and Grey Knights, which got some small but helpful cuts, Space Marines they went very heavy on, and a lot of things got pretty massive improvements. I've been through the massive list of Space Marine changes in a lot of detail in a previous video, but perhaps some of the biggest winners out of the lot are things like Inceptors, Assault Terminators, Stern Guard, Attack Bikes, Eradicators, and a bunch of vehicles. They do have a pretty crazy amount of free war gear going on inside their list as well, meaning that you can be taking a bunch of opportunistic stuff like Power Fists, Pistols, and Combi Weapons. In general, there's going to be a fair few more Space Marines on the board, and they'll be easier to kill, but a fair bit better armed. On top of that, they made a change to the Combat Doctrines, which helps out the Devastator Doctrine quite a lot. You don't have to progress from your Doctrines anymore, back to the way that it was when the Codex came out in 8th edition. In particular, this means that you can sit in Devastator Doctrine all game long if you want, 
and this makes Iron Hands in particular truly spectacular. Their combat doctrine gives you move and shoot with heavy weapons on infantry, plus reroll ones to hit, and I feel like a lot of lists are going to be running Iron Hands with that, and just blazing away with some amped up firepower with extra AP all game long. The tactical doctrine chapters also get a bit of help out of this. I feel like Salamanders are another quite big winner out of that, particularly as aggressors went down quite a lot with their flamestorms. That's not all though, as they've also got the troops getting sticky objectives. The rule is that if you control an objective with Space Marine troops in your command phase, and then you move off it, the objective will continue to be yours, meaning that that troops unit could take the fight to the enemy, or maybe go off in search of taking another objective. It is pretty handy, and takes away some tough decisions when playing a game. Finally, as if all of that weren't enough, the secondary objectives for the Space Marines got helped out a bit as well. Codex Warfare got a small improvement, but Oaths of Moment particularly got better, getting two victory points again for holding the middle of the board. Overall, I think for just about every Space Marine chapter, there are going to be big winners coming out of this. I'd say that not every unit necessarily got better. Some units, like certain vehicles, just didn't really drop quite enough for it to be meaningful. But I feel like if you're taking the new better units, plus the combat doctrines, the troops and the secondaries into account, Space Marines on the whole are way better. Perhaps not the best for internal balance though, I feel like we're going to be seeing an absolute ton of plasma inceptors and probably a lot of lists running iron hands as well. Otherwise, I thought we'd just quickly rattle through the more divergent chapters, which have got a lot more of their own unique units. I'd say that Blood Angels have been helped out just a little bit less than most Space Marines by this. Their Sanguinary Guard are the same cost, and they don't have Armour of Contempt, though they do get to make up for it a bit with some free Inferno pistols, so it's not all bad. They maybe don't care quite as much about the Doctrines or the Troops changes though, but probably it's not the worst thing in the world, seeing as they were already kind of strong before the updates. For the Death Watch, their Dominus Aegis shield is going to be a lot more useful again now. It was a bit less relevant when Armour of Contempt was a thing, but now 5 plus inbore saves are a good protection for the newer, cheaper and more dangerous marines. I feel like the Death Watch changes maybe don't stack up amazingly well against standard space marines. If you're building around their Proteus kill team, you might well be better off just taking Stern Guard in another chapter. They both get a ton of free gear and combi weapons, but the Proteus kill team costs a lot more. They also can't make very good use of the Doctrine changes, and they got some small points bumps to their kill team costs, but I would bear in mind that despite all of these nerfs, a lot of the composite parts of their kill teams went down a lot in costs. They are quite like the reductions to things like Heavy Intercessors and Aggressors in particular. For the Space Wolves, most of their roster went down as well. The Wolfen didn't, and they'll remain good, but Thunderwolf Cavalry got a lot better as well. The Wolfguard Terminators are quite nice, being able to combo things like the Storm Shields with various bits of flexible war gear. And Devastator Longfangs are looking a bit nicer as well, now their gear is cheaper. They're quite nice for the Space Wolves with their move and shoot for no penalty stratagem. The Dark Angels I also think have done particularly well out of all of this. They'll love the very cheap Thunderhammer and Storm Shield Terminators for 33 points, particularly with Oaths of Moment, and they could still build out to a full Deathwing detachment and make them obsec. If you're going Ravenwing on the other hand, army-wide invuls are again a bit more relevant without Armour of Contempt. They can keep their Ravenwing Doctrine all game long if they'd like. Their Black Knights went down to 30 points, though they did lose their Ravenwing specific secondary Death on the Wind. I'd also bear in mind that both the Ravenwing and Deathwing unique detachments now have to comprise your entire army with that Arcs of Omen detachment, so technically that is a bit of a nerf there. If you're not going with either of those though, and are just embracing the Plasma lifestyle, then Damage 3 Plasma with their Inceptor squads is looking insanely scary now. They're an efficient unit full stop, never mind if they get that kind of power. Finally, for the Black Templars, again, they'll like all the decreases to most of the core units. I think they'll get on well with the Terminators as well. Their 5 plus Invul save Vow, like the Ravenwing and the Death Watch, will be a little bit more relevant again. Very good for things like their Crusader squads, but could be handy for things like Impulsors as well, which means that you can take a Bellacaster's Missile Launcher for free now instead of the Shield Dome. As well as that, they got drops to their characters and Crusader squads, plus a sort of more secondary buff. Again, I feel like the Black Templars will be doing kind of well. It'll be interesting to see where the Space Marine meta settles, and whether or not it's just shooting all the way. I feel like Iron Hands are the biggest standout winners of the whole update. The Devastator Doctrine is amazing, but I feel like Dark Angels and Salamanders are particularly better as well. They might gain a bit of ground on their peers. Finally, last but by no means least for once, we have the Adeptus Mechanicus. And again, they were kind of vying with the Space Marines for the weakest armies in Warhammer 40k, at least before these updates came out. Like the Space Marines, Games Workshop really hasn't held back hard on making the Adeptus Mechanicus a bit better. Again, they've got some very, very big points across a whole bunch of different units. 
The vehicles like the Onagers and the Scorpius tanks are very cheap. A lot of their infantry units went down. And I feel like one of the biggest winners might be the Sindonian Dragoons dropping down to 55 points with the Taser Lance. That's very threatening with that profile. The Cataphron Servitors gained core as well. That's be great for a whole load of big combos within the Codex. As a whole ton of their most powerful abilities key off that. And they're going to be a much better troops unit. The secondary objectives were much improved as well. Again, the Admec ones were particularly dire when he compared them to the better ones in the game. And I do quite like the way that you can ally some knights in for a nice flavour win there. It was a bit of a shame that they have kind of felt heavily disincentivized with the command point restrictions in Nephilim. For downsides for them, perhaps losing the Skitari veteran cohort isn't the best news in the world. That was currently pretty much their strongest build, so they won't be able to manipulate their doctrinas quite as nicely. I feel like the big points buffs do make up for that though. With the points changes, it might be a bit more optimal to mix it up with some Skitari and some Cult Mechanicus though. A lot of the Cult units did get better. Overall, the Devs and Mechanicus really look like big winners to me. I feel like a lot of their units are looking genuinely threatening again. I am a little bit uncertain as to whether or not this is going to make them into one of the stronger armies in the game, or just a bit more mid-tier overall. I feel like they are looking quite good, but they were coming from a place of being pretty underwhelming against most of the armies in 40k. So with that done, we've covered each faction in the game. Definitely a pretty exciting time to be playing Warhammer 40k. I feel like Games Workshop have turned quite a lot of the established order on its head with the last days of 9th. Perhaps for the biggest winners, the Admech and Space Marines take the four. I feel like the Guard Custodians and Knights have done very well out of it as well though. Though admittedly some armies have come off far worse. Tyranids and Harlequins are drastically taken down a peg, as are Chaos Space Marines, and a few others haven't done so well like Tau and Thousand Sons either. This will be interesting to see where this all settles. I'll certainly be looking to make a fair few more faction review videos over the next few days, and hopefully a bit of a predictive tier list after that. Let me know your thoughts though. Do you see these changes fairly similar? Or are there any armies that you think got better or worse than I said? Otherwise, if you'd like to see some more videos like this, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics. I'll certainly keep them coming as regularly as I can. And if you'd like something else to watch, then I'll link my Space Marine boss video down in the video description. That's the one where I go over each of the points changes to the Space Marines, and there is rather a lot of good stuff for them. Otherwise, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well. And that's how I can afford to keep on making big videos like this quite so often. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.